Hi, everybody. I'm Allison Lubovitz, and I am thrilled to be interviewing um, another phenomenal director filmmaker as part of our 16th annual Jewish film series here in Chattanooga, Tracy Whipple. Thank you for joining us and for having this brief conversation and interaction about your film, Broken Dolls. Absolutely. I'm very honored. And let me preface by saying also keep the compliments coming. Fabulous, fantastic director. I'm, I'm here for all of it. Thank you. Well, before we get into this serious work of deconstructing, you know, how this film came to be and, and just your emotional and personal, you know, reaction and, and kind of the byproduct of all this. And, and for anyone who hasn't seen the film, we're going to have some spoiler alerts in here. So I want to give you fair warning. We will be talking about what's in the film, but I promise it will not ruin the film for you at all. It is still incredibly captivating and, and you should absolutely watch it if you haven't already. But before we get there, when I was researching your bio, I couldn't help but notice something that grabbed my attention, which is alligator wrangler. <laughs> or wrestler or something of that sort. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that before we get into Broken Dolls? Yes. So um, I <laughs> I definitely gave my mother back in the day plenty of, uh, plenty of worry in her life. I was the kind of young lady that if there was some kind of an adventure, I was saying yes to it. And in this case, um, the short story is Somehow I ended up seeing an article in a newspaper that this woman was starting a, basically a, an, an, a village where she had alligators and wanted a female alligator wrestler. And ping, I was like, okay, that sounds like something I definitely want to participate in. Um, I happened to very at the same, almost at the same time, meet somebody that was one of the best alligator wrestlers in South Florida. <laughs> I mean, how could I say no? And he said, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll show you how to do it. So we took a ride up there and uh, he said, get in the pit. Let's do it. He showed me how to do it. The next show, the woman uh, that was kind of heading up the whole thing got in there. She did the show. The alligator bit her, almost bit her finger off. And she looked at me. She said, can you do the next show? I said, why? Absolutely. <laughs> so I, I, did it from then on, never got injured. Uh, I did it for about four years or so. You know, you know what they say about us Floridians. I know. <laughs> it's true. I, mean, I would imagine that's almost on everybody's resume down there, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At the, it's a, you know what? As time has gone on, um, I kind of forget that I've done that. I mean, I don't forget, but it's not at the four. So when somebody brings it up, I sometimes blush a little bit, but you did some research and you, you dug up the good stuff. So, well, and I say that in the context of it will not surprise anybody to learn that you are an alligator wrestler when they see how you um, managed to wrestle with a very complicated and uncomfortable truth in terms of your mother's history, your family history, um, as you go down sort of, oh my gosh, this this rabbit hole of sorts. Um, really, that started, I think, with with a plight to get your mother German citizenship, um, and then ends with quite a, quite a um, a remarkable and and somewhat I think devastating realization in the end. But um, but the the journey you take us on is really incredible. Tell me and tell us a little bit about how this started. Um, and and I want to say um, your mother, who has since passed, may her memory continue to be a blessing. And I can only imagine how proud she was of this endeavor. But what what was the first thing that made you think I, I really want to do this for my mom and for me and my family, and also I want to to record it. You know, I want to capture this for others to see. Yes. So. We had always heard my mother, you know, tell her stories, as we say, her little anecdotes, and they were always funny. We we would chuckle. She always told the she told them in this way that was humorous and like in this little golden light. And we just listened to it as it was. And we realizing how old she was and her health was declining, it was starting to decline. And first of all, let me say this is a woman that in her mid 40s, she had thyroid cancer. She had her thyroid taken out in her 70s. She had stage four colon cancer erupt, you know, so it, it, this woman, when I say she had been through hell and back, like she, that was on top of, uh, you know, the Holocaust. So, you know, I thought, duh, you know, just record her on the phone, you know, just even if it's a few things, record some of these stories. Um, so actually it started out 
just recording on the phone, just on an iPhone. And I actually, at the same time, met, I'm telling you how things happen is just, yeah. if you allow things to happen, they do. And it's like just a, it's like a mind bender. I met Gilles Bovon and he's with the co-director and also a life partner now, but I met him at basically at that same time. And he happened to be like this award-winning <laughs> documentary film director in Europe um, for, you know, Arte, you know, basically the, right. the PBS equivalent in, in Europe and uh, just a long resume. And I told him about, you know, me wanting to record my mother and some of her stories. And he thought, you know, of course, definitely do that. He's all for documenting things. He's, 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 he's French, but he's also Swiss document things, you know, be very <laughs> structured and do it. So started out on the phone. And as I'm recording her and we're talking, I had opened my mind's eye a little bit more and my ears. And I started listening to how she was telling these stories and questioning more than I ever had. Because I also remembered, you know, we never questioned my grandmother and she really took a lot of things with her historically. So I'm, and I'm, I'm speaking with Gilles and he's saying, this is really interesting. And we both kind of had this notion. She was really suppressing a lot more than we thought, really hiding a lot more than we thought. So he said, do you really want to do this? Hmm. And I know what he meant. He said, do you like, do you really want to do the, do you want to do it justice? And I looked at him, I said, I absolutely do. And at that very moment too, it started this avalanche of realizing what, what we might discover. Um, I was ready for that. That was okay. But I also realized how in the family, we also, we already have a bit of some strife going on, which a lot of families have, but I thought I have to treat this really carefully because it could make things worse, but hopefully if it made things worse, it could make things better, you know, either one or the other. So we, what started out and you'll see if you, if you watch the film, you see the images aren't always the most professional. They were the best that I could do at the time because it was also the start of COVID and we couldn't really have anybody coming in, you know, without testing every single time. So we just kept going down, like you said, going down the rabbit hole and going down the rabbit hole. And thankfully my mother, she was very open about the things that she was speaking about, but because I think she had also compartmentalized. So you know, there were times as we were opening it, I, I could watch her start, start to pull back a little, start to come forward. And we just had to keep plugging along with this. Um, and it's funny, I don't know how far I want to go in without doing much of a spoiler. Right. But you know, the first half of the film is really basically in her apartment most of the time. Um, and then, then it opens up to, you know. Which you don't even realize it. I mean, even I think the, the location it's, it's, it doesn't, it's not monotonous. It doesn't feel like you're, you're stuck. I was so engrossed with the conversation and also the evolution of her coming to, to grips with her own past. Right. And you can see that physically and emotionally, and that it just, it becomes, I think, very overwhelming for the audience too. And I can only imagine for you, um, as you went through this, I, you know, it's, you said, you know, when when he, when you were asked, are you ready to do this, right? I also wondered, not just like do it right, but were you ready for the answers you got? I often tell my kids, like your father and I will be honest with you about anything you ask, but you better be ready for the answers, right? Like it's sometimes easy to ask the question. Accepting the answers is the most difficult job we have, I think, especially as evolving adults. Were you, when you look back, were you ready for those answers? I was, I was prepared to accept whatever answers came that I, I, I am that kind of person. And, and you saw the film. So, you know, what I, when I say, I, I had to tell the truth. My grandmother used to say all the time, I only tell the truth. I only <laughs> tell the truth. And I've, as my daughter was growing up, I always told her, you don't, when somebody asks you a question, you are not obligated to answer them. But if you do answer them, it better be the truth, which again, I think, I mean, I, you know, you see, I'm, I'm 50 or I'm, I think I was turning 49 or 50 at during, I don't know if we even included that. There's a couple of versions of the film. And um, I was, you know, I finally had gotten to an age where, I, again, like I said, I opened my mind and I just knew that I am prepared for the answers. And you see it in a certain part of the film, I said, I I'm not going to lie to my mother. 
I'm not going to lie. That's what this all, this whole thing is about because it's hard to say lies. I know that, I know that my grandmother was trying to protect my mother. And then I know my mother was trying to protect her children. That's a, you know, that's a decision you make looking at what you have right here and what you have in your toolbox, you know, yeah. so to speak. And that's what she had. And and she was doing it from the kindness of her heart. But unfortunately, there were a lot of repercussions in the family. Um, it's hard. I think it was really hard for her, as you see, and the film is called Broken Dolls for a reason. She really did when you were in her apartment. And this was and the apartment you see in the film was the one was the one we we had moved her to and it was already kind of cleared out the one we moved her from was like just <laughs> she it's like she was trying to fill every little space with something something would that would make her happy something she could touch something she had acquired that could almost take her away it, it, i i'm a, i'm a firm believer that what you have going on in your mind psychologically is very much uh, um, a representation a lot of times of your past and how you're trying to treat things. And so she was always putting something up that would make her smile. And I think probably help keep her from reminding of, of her childhood, probably in a lot of ways, even though she, in a lot of ways was still kind of childlike, like she created her little scenarios and her little vignettes. That was her joy. Um, and it was really incredible. We didn't have to make up these little vignettes that we would find. And they were, as as the film went on and as we kept diving in, I would say, oh my gosh, my mother didn't, I don't think she was even cognizant. She was representing things that either she had never even experienced herself, but in, they were familial or that she had, and maybe she had put away the, the one scene where it's my, uh, the little ceramic of the, what ended up representing my grandmother and and my mother's, you know, fa actual father with the clerk and signing. My mother just had this wonderful little ceramic was right there. And literally we went, oh my gosh, this, this is the epitome of, of what happened. Right. She just, I don't know how she knew to, to do it, but she did. And it, and you see in that moment when we tell her, you know, when we bring her father to her, basically, she, we weren't prepared. It just cuts right in the middle of me taking my phone out going, oh my gosh, record this. She just turned into this, this, this little girl that, that just discovered something so important that she didn't even know was so important to her. You know, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> This is my first opportunity actually to speak to somebody who's asking me questions about it in this way. So still sometimes I get so involved in the, in the editing and the marketing. I, it's like, it brings me back to when we did it. And well, like, that's what I love that it, it is feels so raw. Like the, the fact that you're using an iPhone and you're in an apartment and y'all you're outside having this discussion, uh, which would have been, you thought just a casual discussion. And then she does, she I, I, again, spoiler alert, right? Like, but she kept saying, I wrote it down three times because she kept saying, I have a daddy, right? And it is, it's that that childlike response to that. And that's when, to me, really in your film where you see the, the transition, where yes. she really sort of breaks down those walls that she obviously had for, for many decades. For her behalf, I think for survivalship, and it also seems like on behalf of you and your and your family members to make sure that she was preserving any sense of normalcy she could. But yes. after that, it is. I mean, I think you even termed it um, an unveiling, but a liberation. Yes, yes, absolutely, and it's both. And again, with that, there's always the positive, and then there's always, I mean, not necessarily the negative, but there's always a flip side. They say you don't know short if you don't know tall. You know, with that came came some repercussions for her i mean and you do see it's like she was waiting for these things to happen in her life they wouldn't have happened if it weren't for i mean she wasn't going to do it on her own she just didn't have the wherewithal but and then you see you see her health declining during this period i mean really it was not long after the last basically the last segment that we filmed she didn't she didn't pass all that long after i think it was maybe five months but the mo wonderful thing. So Gilles is very good at editing. I mean, he, he did that for a really long time. 
he's got a nickname in French and I couldn't remember what it was. I don't, my French isn't so great, but basically all of his colleagues are like, tell, like he splits it and he split, you know, he does this and he, yeah. and he really will invest himself like crazy. Sometimes I'm like, hello, it's, we got to eat something here. We got, you know, the sun has, has risen and it's set. You come out of there, come out of your cave. So he's so good at that, that even sometimes I was like, wait, when did, did you, with how, how did she look so different? So so quick. It's got to be the editing. He's like, no, she really, it's like, this was what her, her psyche, her body, her emotions were waiting for something like this. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't long after. And I, and I know when I was, I was with her and I, he was in France and I messaged him. And then I called him. I said, you got to put something together for her to see. And he says, I know I'm working on, it. I said, no, you need to like now. He said, is she, is she really getting that bad? I said, yeah. I said, it, she's starting to detach from this realm at this point. And I want her to be able to see something. And he went to work and it was, it was, you know, it's like a, it was like the cave person version of what, of what you see now, no animation or anything like that. But she got, I, I got to show it to her five days before she passed. And I just watched her watch it. And she was a woman that she'd watch something, but she didn't, she'd get up and make coffee or do things. She was really tuned in. And afterwards I just looked at her and I said, you know, did we do it? Did, did we do it for you, mom? Did you like, and she said, she looked at me, she said, I loved it. Mm. And I just was like, okay, all right, <laughs> good. The only audience that matters, right? You took the words right out of my mouth, Allison. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I mean, and you think about, I mean, even going back, like you connecting with Jill and then deciding to do this for your mother. And then five days before she passes, like there was no time to waste. And in the middle of COVID that all this Thank happened. You. Yeah, you're right. supposed to secure funding and you're supposed to write grant proposals. And I sold a house, let's just put it that way. <laughs> and it's, you can see it wasn't like, you know, some grant, there's not a lot of special effects and stuff, you know, so we kept a cap on the money, but I was like, no, I, I, if I got to sell a house, I got to sell a house. There was no time to write grant proposals and no time to ask for money. I kind of started doing it and I was like, yeah, forget it. it I'll do what I got to do. You know, I'll do it after the fact if, if I have to do it, but it, it couldn't have come any later. It had to, it had to be when it had to be. No, my favorite quote I tell our kids especially is don't let perfect be the enemy of great because if not you will wait your whole life for perfection and it's literally doesn't exist it yes. just thank you that's it yeah. if you say it's yeah. perfect it's perfect it is. <laughs> it's not a fact it's an opinion well and especially during COVID I used to say you know what things are okay and okay <laughs> it's pretty awesome right now so let's it's all exactly. really I want to <laughs> unpack a little bit more that's not a spoiler alert, but things that you you talked about in the film, but I really want to understand a little bit more of the background in, in the few minutes we have left. Mm -hmm. You said you didn't know you were Jewish until <laughs> you were in your 20s, and you didn't go to synagogue even until you were in your 40s. So mm -hmm. what was your childhood like, and how did that revelation take hold of, of your identity and the way that you really raised your own children, um, the way that you've lived your life, because, you know, like, obviously, like now you're, a, you're a Jewish documentary filmmaker. So <laughs> things have evolved since then as well. Yes. Well, I heard, I learned from the goodbye at the Frankfurt uh, synagogue. I said, well, yeah, but it's like my mom's side. It wasn't raised that way. He says, you're a Jew. I said, okay. yeah, but I mean, not really, because he was like, you can't get away from it. You're a Jew. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay, okay. I accept this. And of course, I mean, my mother, when I tell you she had Santa Claus and Christmas, like bleh, all over all the time. I don't even know if she knew. I don't think she was cognizant of why she was doing that. I think she was just trying to get away from everything that reminded her of painful past. So she created the, like a fantasy land of Christmas every year, went crazy with presents under the tree. I mean, she would get bored of wrapping and then eventually she just put a big sheet of wrapping paper over a pile of presents. She was like, listen, I don't have time for that. But it was, it was, I know it was an escape for her. She was trying to assimilate so hard that she was just doing all the motions. And I had, it's like, it, I, I can look back and see the bits and pieces of being a Jew or having, you know, Judaism around me. My grandmother used to go in um, for the high holidays. She would go visit her cousin and, and whatnot up in New York. All I knew is that she, whenever she would come home, 
she would put the suitcase on the on the bed or on the sofa and open it up and we had sausages we had joy the candies we had the smoked chubbies like i was interested in the food and she just bring in the food the gefil- the jars of gefilte fish everything it was like the best thing ever i didn't know it was jewish food i just knew it was food then like I said, little bits and pieces. And I remember there's a big scene that's cut out because my, the thing would have been five hours long. I'm in, When I'm in my, the kitchen with my mother making latkes, potato pancakes. <laughs> I remember- Don't forget the onion. I know. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And of course, I never would in, in my life have forgotten the onions, but because I said something's missing and we were looking at it, editing it going, hello, something's missing. That's exactly, you know, it's representing something that's missing. So I'm in there talking and I remember being in, in eighth grade and my friend went to this really great school. I was, I didn't get to go to the school. She went to the great school. And I remember she was telling me, this is crazy. She said, there are these, these girls at school and they're rich and they're smart and they get everything they want. And they're so spoiled. They call them Japs. And I was like, what? I was like, I want to be a Jap because I just, you know, my mother was a waitress. My father was a bus driver a frustrated actor, but a bus driver. We didn't have a lot of money. My grandmother lived with us. She she helped out a lot, but we didn't come from money. And I just was kind of unhappy. You know, in eighth grade, you're struggling with everything. So I just heard about these girls that were at this great school and and they, you know, their their parents drove really nice cars and it was everything that I didn't have. So in my mind, it was everything I wasn't. And I just wanted to be something different. So I remember her saying Japs and I didn't even know what that meant. And I, at some point I was like, Jewish American princess, Jewish American princess. And I, and it, at the time I kept saying, I want to be that. And it didn't even occur to me. Well, I am Jewish. It's like this, just a disconnection. And you're at, of course, at that age too, you, your head so far, you know, up the, up the tuchus that, you're just not noticing anything else around you. Do you know what I mean? We've all been there. We've all been in eighth grade. I don't know what your time was like, but oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing you not. So maybe you we're know. the same age. So we also grew up, you know, in the seventies and eighties where, you know, it was unforgiving. <laughs> Thank yeah. goodness. No social media. That's all I'll say. Oh, I would have been, I would have been a nightmare worse. I would have been worse, but you know, and, and at, like I said, as time went on, I didn't, these things that were right in front of me, I just was looking around. I did a little bit of my mom. I looked all around for everything else and didn't see what was right in front of me. And I, I did, it was a slow dawning of, of being Jewish and like going, oh, Hanukkah. Maybe I can celebrate Hanukkah. Hanukkah sounds fun. I know how to make the food. I was a chef for, you know, 18 years. Well, now it's 18 years. But at the time I was just getting out of culinary school and I was like learning to make things and exploring world cuisine, which was cuisine I grew up with. And then, you know, little bits and pieces here and there. And apparently my sisters used to do things with my grandmother, you know, uh, for the holidays and stuff. But by the time I was born, that didn't happen. And when my daughter was born, I said, let's do, let's do little holidays here and there. And I kind of was instilling it in her little by little. And it's really funny because now she just turned 24 yesterday. Yesterday was her birthday. And yeah. now she she wears the Star of David. And so for her, it's kind of also dawning on her the little the little seeds that have been planted. Um, but of course now this is a this is a tough time to to kind of be discovering that in the world. You think things have gotten better, but it's yeah. as much as tumultuous as it's ever been. I don't know if humans can ever really change. And it's part of why I made this film. I do think it's very, it's very Jewish centric, but I also think it's more universal. I think a lot of people struggle with their identity and a lot of people can see this and insert themselves into, you know, a position and, and maybe gain some, some kind of wisdom, no matter w- what your background is. Yeah. And, and along those lines, I'm so fascinated by the Jewish community in Shanghai and what that may or may not look like today. I know, you know, as you were exploring that your mom lived there 10 years, yes. right? And so what, what, what did you learn about the Jewish community? What did, what is your takeaway, you know, now about the Jewish community there? Is there, is there other things you can share with us that didn't make it to the editing room yes. um, in the film? Yes. 
So again, I had heard the stories about living in Shanghai and I was a curious kid, but never thought that's not, how is this possible? And the way my mother would tell it, she had what didn't make it in the film <laughs> is that a lot, when you see a lot of films about, and there aren't very many, we know about the Jewish community in Shanghai, people speak very fondly of Mrs. Hardwick. Everybody knows Mrs. Hardwick as the teacher at the Kadori school and everybody loved her. My mother despised her because my mother says at the time she, um, she got sick a lot and she, like she had, um, I think she had a parasite at one point and the treatment, it made her hair fall out. So she went to school with a, a, like a little wrap around her head. And she said, Mrs. Hardwick went and the kids were making fun. And she said, she kind of helped them make fun of my mother. And that's funny because she never told that story until we started on this journey with her. And that was a story that she told that really deeply affected her. And that was never one of the anecdotes. The anecdotes were always the cute, funny, happy ones. So that was kind of one of the stories we were talking a little bit earlier where I said, okay, she's starting, this is starting to actually bring back some things. And she says it, she said, it's bringing back memories that I'm not so sure I want to remember, but I have to. So she didn't have a great time at the school. And she said, and it's funny because she, she always said, we couldn't really practice our religion in when we were there. But if you look at the Jewish community in Shanghai, they were very observant. Um, and it was really, it, I look and I'm like, gosh, I wish I could time travel and go back there. I mean, for every reason, um, even the bad reasons, I'm kind of one of those weird people where it's like, yeah, I'll suffer a little bit because it's giving me something, you know, right. I'm okay to suffer a little. I don't want to suffer like too long, but I'll suffer a bit. But it was very vibrant and there were Jewish stores and they sold, I mean, they, I mean, they, they were resilient. They created their own just, I mean, this vibrant community with arts and music and, and it was, it was very, and I, and I guess, I mean, it obviously had to be a bit insular just because they were, you know, essentially corralled in one area and you could, for a while you could freely roam around, but it, it was very, it was very dangerous. I mean, my mother, she said she, she had to walk over dead people. She, she said she saw a man basically get bayoneted. I mean, just stabbed it. It was a, ja I guess a Japanese soldier that just, you know, and, and you're thinking how in the world could anybody, these are young children have seen this, how can they recover? And, and she recovered. But again, if you don't address these issues, I don't think you can always thrive the way you really could if the issues are addressed. So even though she was within this Jewish community, you know, and my mother and my mother and grandmother and my uncle, so my mother have has a well, had a brother as well. They weren't super close after they came to the United States, but you know, then my mother um, had a stepfather that that she had to deal with then. Um, so I think they just all, even though there's this wonderful, vibrant community going on, they still all had their little traumas in their life coming from wherever they did and trying to make it where they were. I think they did the best that they could. Um, but you'll see in the film, like. Like I said, I don't think they had, I don't think they had, they didn't, I know they didn't have it easy, but again, some of the choices that my grandmother chose to make, um, it really hit me hard when I learned that it's just not anything I could have pictured my grandmother. And this is a big thing. I don't know how you, how your relationship, if you had grandparents that you met, if you, I don't know if any of them are still alive, but you just look at them, you know, do you ever look at your grandparents and think these are also complex individuals that right. led a life that I have no idea <laughs> about. And to think, I mean, I just think back about my grandmother and, and how she was, I could never have imagined that she led the life that, that she did. And she did some of the things that she had to do. I think. Survival show, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it's being a survivor. She did what she had to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in the DNA. I mean, I, I know that sometimes, and I'll see, I look at my daughter now that she's older and, you know, I look at myself and I think I see some of these traits come out and I didn't know where they came from with me, especially it's like my mother, my father, I don't know. Was it just me? Was it 
you know, nature, nurture, all of those things. And it's like, you no, know, some of that stuff's in the DNA, I really believe. Yeah. Well, in the film, this is a spoiler alert, but I have to ask, I know you end up meeting your mom's sister that you didn't know existed, but we don't see if your mother ever connected with her. Did she, did she talk to her? Did she FaceTime with her? Did she meet her? You know, Allison, I was wondering if you're going to ask me that question. I, I, I don't, I don't get nervous about these things, but I do go, I wonder what, what I'm going to be asked, you know, you know, for this is first for the film. So who knows could what you could have asked me. And I, I was like, no, I think she's going to ask me about that. So one thing that we really hemmed and hawed about putting in the film, because we had, to, we would have had to take something else out to put this in, but my mother was at my sister's. I was in Europe at the time. My mother was at my sister's for Thanksgiving. And my sister said, I don't, I've got to take mom to the hospital. She's really having a hard time breathing and it's just best that she goes. And I'm thinking, and we discussed, I said, all right, I'm going to tell her. I didn't want to tell her beforehand about, about her sister as I wanted it to kind of be, you know, when I was there and whatnot. And I said, all right, well, call, like put me on, put me on video. I'm going to tell her, I'm going to tell her about this because if we don't know if she goes downhill, I want her at least to have something. So my mom's eating her Thanksgiving. She's got her plate on her walker in front of her. She never used the walker for actually walking. It was insane. If used it for a table or something. So she's eating. And I said, mom, I got something to tell you. I said, you remember that surprise? I was going to, you know, surprise you and say that she said, yeah. I said, you ready? She said, yeah, I'm ready. I said, you have a sister. What? What? I said, you have a sister. And, her, and she, she said, I said, her name is Ilsa. She, my, I, it, I watched her say, oh, oh, she was so happy. I have, a, I have a sister. Oh my gosh. She was so excited. And we really, really tried to arrange a way for them to at least be able to video chat, video call. I was in touch with, with Ilsa's son on Instagram. And I don't think he checked very often and just kind of time kept going on. And I also think, and I have to keep reminding myself of this because I got very in the film. We also cut this out. I got very frustrated, very almost angry at a certain point because of what all of a sudden came at me. And I realized how profoundly this would change my mother. And I had seen how happy and elated she was. And then I said, I've got to tell her this, this horrible thing. And we cut out the very angry reaction that I had, not in front of Ilsa. This was when we were to the side. I had to keep reminding myself that this was also shocking for Ilsa too. This was out of the blue for her. And I had to, I had to turn up, put my, my compassion, you know, to really to work on that because, and I had to remember too, you know, she's looking at her, her daddy too, in, in this light, because that's what you do as a daughter. It's your daddy. So unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't happen that they, that they got to connect because I, yeah, I think I was also a little bit worried and my mother didn't press it after that. I think for her, just hearing the news of something like that was enough. Just knowing. I, yeah. I think just knowing was enough for her. Yeah. So we know your mother's reaction, right? We know that she loved the film. What has it, this been like for your family? Has it mm -hmm. been a reconciliation? Has it been uh, something that's unified you more? Has it has it broken you apart more? How how has this landed for you and your siblings and your family members and your daughter in a way that maybe you hoped for or maybe you didn't expect? Hmm. Well, so so I have three sisters that are my mother's daughters. So there's four of us. And my uh, the one sister um, who was really very, pretty instrumental and in kind of assisting with this, the one that I said, oh my gosh, she looked up my, my mother's name, Renata Tannenbaum. And all of a sudden this information came up and it was like, oh, duh. You know, so for her, she was kind of involved the whole time. The other two sisters actually have not seen it yet. And there's, it's a very soon in the next couple of weeks, they're going to come to the house and we're going to watch it all together. And quite frankly, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure what's going to happen with that. Um, I'm prepared for that. I'm preparing for some, to wear a little bit of armor that day, but also be receptive. Um, because really, truly, um, how do I say this? 
my 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 the the two youngers and she's still even 14 years older than i am we suffered far less than the two olders so i i try to always keep that in mind and that's why i try to be very respectful um during the making of it there's a lot we didn't even put in there just because you know even though some, we can be at odds sometimes i still love them and i respect them and i wouldn't put them in a situation that could make them feel further damaged or, um, you know, I, it's just, I just wouldn't want it to be very respectful. Um, as for, uh, as for my daughter, it was, I think it was really wonderful for her to see it actually. And every time she sees it, even whatever incarnation it is, she just, she starts to cry. She's also quite emotional like me. So she, I think as time goes on too, she'll get more and more out of it, you know, cause we all have our struggles and, and I can, it's almost like whenever she watches it, she gets a, a new little, a light goes off for her and she can see and it turns and she can see a little bit more um, of the whys, the hows and what will be's in her life. So. Well, my hope is that they all find the joy that you brought your mother through the discovery, even the painful, uncomfortable truths that you bestowed upon her you could see that it was a relief, right? And and a gift. And really, Tracy, uh, Broken Dolls is a gift for all of us. Thank so thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking time to have this conversation today. We we are thrilled that you are, you are out on the landscape of humanity, uh, yes. bringing to bear these truths. As you said in the film, the truth will always find you. And we're so glad that, that we found you. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to go catch my train and I wish you the best in 2024, Allison. Thank Happy you. New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah. Bye.